Lord God, you are set apart from all sin and our every failure to love you with all that we are and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We see our guilt. We stand silent before you. We have nothing to say in our defense. Like King David, we confess our sins and seek your mercy. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Because of his great mercy, God has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. This good news leads us to sing God's praise with joy and gratitude. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Come, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God. Hopping in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the seas and the dry land. In our Old Testament lesson from Ezekiel chapter 33, the prophet is called to warn God's people. Their words about their sin were really saying things are hopeless, so why should we give up on our sins? Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sins, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sin 
weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O people of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. Our, our second lesson from Ephesians chapter 4 is a reminder that our recognizing sins in others and speaking to that is to point them to Christ who sacrificed himself for them. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord.
have a children's message for children in the pews of all ages. You know what I have up here with me today? This is some wasp and hornet killer. This is poison, okay? Now let's say that uh, one of you children have a playmate or maybe a little brother or sister and they don't know any better and they think it'd be kind of cool to put this on their ice cream as a topping. Or maybe they want to spray it in their mouth. That'd be kind of fun to do, right? They don't know any better. What would you do if you saw a friend or sibling who was going to do something like that? You'd say, no, don't do that, right? You'd warn them because you care about them. This could make you sick. This could send you to the hospital. This is poison. You don't want them to do something that's going to hurt them, right? Love would warn them. You know, we're not supposed to be a tattletale, but if we see somebody's really in danger, someone's going to be harmed, the loving thing to do is to point it out and to warn them not to do it. Well, Jesus is going to tell us to do the same thing in our sermon today, not about hornet spray, but about sin. He wants us to realize that sinning, we want to avoid as much as putting this on our ice cream. Okay? It's a bad thing. And so sometimes your parents are going to discipline you when you do something wrong, and sometimes as Christians, we're going to confront one another, but we do it in love. Because I don't want anyone to get hurt by poison, and I don't want anyone to be harmed by sin. And most of all, we want to point people back to Jesus so they can talk over that forgiveness that he won for them, which is what motivates us to want to live in a God-pleasing way. We're going to learn more about that in our sermon coming up. Our devotion today is taken from Jesus' words in Luke chapter 6. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, while you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, Take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is the word of our Lord. I also invite you to look to page 13 of the worship folder. It has a sermon outline. You can take that home to meditate on the key points this week. Do you know what the most popular verse in the Bible is for unchurched people? The one they love to quote to you the most? It's Jesus' words in our devotion today. Do not judge. They may not know anything else that the Bible teaches. 
but they hang on to that one verse in which they insist Jesus said, we're never supposed to judge anyone for anything they ever do. It's their go-to verse whenever they're indulging in some sort of sinful behavior and don't want anyone to tell them what they're doing is wrong. They don't want anyone to tell them to repent and change their sinful ways. Instead, they expect everyone else is supposed to change how they view their behavior and come to accept it as being perfectly good and beneficial as long as it works for them. Yes, for many people today, the standard for making lifestyle choices is simply this. If it feels good, do it. If it works for you, it must be okay. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And so if you consider their behavior to be sinful, well, then you're the one who is in error. Because after all, Jesus said, you're never supposed to judge anyone, right? So how do you respond to that assertion? Is it ever okay to judge someone? That's the tough question we're going to tackle today from the perspective of God's holy word. As we take a closer look at Jesus' words in Luke chapter 6, we're going to discover that Jesus does not forbid all judging of any kind. In fact, in these verses, and in plenty of other verses throughout the Bible, we are actually encouraged to make sound judgments. For example, in verse 42 of our devotion, Jesus told us that when you first take that plank out of your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is it ever okay to judge someone? The answer is yes, most certainly yes, as long as we remember to follow some key biblical principles. First things first. When you judge others, first remember to judge yourself and repent of your own sins. Second, when you judge Always seek to benefit those who hear you speaking in love. And third, when you make judgments, always follow God's word as the standard for determining right and wrong. Let's begin by reviewing that first key principle. When you judge others, first remember to examine yourself and repent of your own sinful ways. Now, why is this so important? Well, Jesus explained it well in our devotion. He said, Why do you look at that little speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when you fail to see the plank in your own eye? See, the real danger in judging others is that we become blind to our own sins. Let's be honest. It's real easy for us to find fault with everyone else around us. But it's difficult to recognize our own sinful behavior. We have this blind spot. It's a defense mechanism we use to keep the the spotlight focused on the wrongdoings of others in order to carefully avoid any examination of our own faults. Oh, we'd like to consider our sins to be quite minor compared to the terrible behavior of all those people out there we love to condemn. In fact, by comparison, our sins are hardly even worth mentioning. Over time, We can turn into proud, self-righteous Pharisees who love to boast. God, I thank you that I'm not like all those rotten sinners out there. I'm so good, I don't even know if I need a Savior or His forgiveness anymore. I think He'll accept me just the way I am. That's why the Apostle Paul warns us in Galatians chapter 6. He said, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourselves, or you too may be tempted. Did you catch it here? Paul actually encourages us to judge a fellow Christian who's caught up in sinful living with gentleness and compassion. But then he also issues a warning that we not fall for a trap of our own. The temptation we face when we judge other people is a failure to examine our own sinful behavior and repent of our own sinful ways. Such pride impenitence, stubbornness, puts up a wall between us and our Savior, drives us back into spiritual slavery, and eventually can erode Christian faith altogether. That's why God wants us to regularly examine ourselves in the light of God's law. If we fail to do so, we turn into these very proud, 
self-righteous people who love to look down on everyone else from our high and lofty perch above. So how can we blast through these defense mechanisms, these walls of denial? How can we keep from adopting such kind of a judgmental attitude toward other people? How can we see ourselves clearly as God intends us to? The best way is to take a good, honest look at ourselves and our behavior in the mirror of God's holy law. And that calls for daily contrition and repentance on our part. You know, it's also important to remember that God's law really makes no distinction between sins. Understand that all of our sins are deeply offensive to God. All of our sins are destructive to us. Any one of our sins earns for us God's anger and his eternal punishment. Think of it this way. When you sin, it's kind of like drinking cyanide deadly poison. Drink a gallon of it, it's going to kill you. Drink a quart of it, it's going to kill you. Drink just a little cup of it, it's still going to kill you. See how it makes no sense to compare our sins to the sins of others? Remember, the fifth commandment doesn't just forbid the sin of murder. It also condemns us for our hateful, unkind words and even harboring a grudge against someone in our heart. The sixth commandment doesn't just forbid adultery and homosexuality. It also condemns us for using filthy language, viewing pornography, or permitting indecent thoughts to linger in our minds. So people who commit big sins like murder or rape or terrorism, they need to repent of their sins or they will die in them. But the truth be told, you and I also need to repent of what we consider to be our little sins or they too will destroy us. Honestly, the only conclusion we can draw when we examine our lives and our behavior in the mirror of God's law is that each of us is a poor, miserable sinner who falls short of the glory of God. We desperately need a Savior and His forgiveness. And in Jesus Christ, we found the healing and the cleansing and the forgiveness that we so desperately need. Friends, do you see why it's so important that you first examine yourself before the judging the sins of other people? When you first recognize your own sins, repent of them, and turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness, it gives you an attitude adjustment. Proud, self-righteous Pharisees become humble, penitent children of God, washed spotlessly clean by the blood of Jesus. No longer do we wish to look down on others from our high and lofty, self-righteous perch above. Rather, now we're going to view others as fellow sinners who need the freedom and the forgiveness Jesus offers them just as desperately as we do. And that leads us to our second key principle. When you judge others, always seek to benefit those who hear you. We don't judge other people because we want to tell them off or we want to feel superior to them. Rather, we speak the truth and love to others because we care about their spiritual welfare. We want to help draw them closer to their Savior. The Apostle James points out the benefits of confronting one another in love when he writes, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save them from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. I guess it all comes down to recognizing just how serious sin really is and understanding the consequences of remaining in it impenitent. Think of it this way. Let's say that out ahead, a bridge has collapsed. And everyone who goes over that bridge is going to plunge to their death. But a thick, heavy fog obscures that bridge. And so people don't recognize the danger that lies ahead for them. But you do. You know what's going to happen to those people if they keep heading down that deadly path. Will you warn your neighbor of the danger they're facing or keep silent? Love would compel you to warn them to confront them, to urge them to turn around and turn back to safety, wouldn't it? Now what if there were a hundred other people on that road foolishly just waving the people on, saying, keep going that way, it's fine, it's safe. Would their foolish talk stop you? No, if you truly recognize the danger they're facing, if you truly care about their welfare, you would feel compelled to confront them, to warn them, to do everything you could to save their life. 
Love would compel you to speak and act for their benefit. How is it any different when a brother or sister is caught up in sinful living? Don't buy the lie that living contrary to God's word is no big deal. You can just slough it off. Don't buy the lie that you can do whatever you want and suffer no consequences for it. The truth is, living contrary to the teachings of the Bible is always offensive to God. It's always harmful to us, and it's always destructive to the people around us. Jesus sternly warns, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We don't want people to be caught up in spiritual slavery, do we? And the Apostle Paul warns, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now Paul is not saying that if anyone's ever committed any one of those sins, they can't go to heaven. But he is warning that if you willfully continue in any sin, you put yourself at risk. And if you die in impenitence and unbelief, you will perish eternally. I'm not going to judge you, but God will. Christian friends, do you see that sin is not anything ever to take lightly, to take pride in, to make excuses for, to continue with? Sin is something we want to absolutely abhor, avoid, repent of, and turn and trust in Jesus for forgiveness. Let me offer today just a few examples of areas of Christian living in which we can all use some gentle encouragement. Consider the importance of regular attendance at public worship and Holy Communion. I know some people have needed to watch online because of health concerns. But it's also vitally important that we worship here together as a Christian family and receive the blessings of Holy Communion together. I didn't say that. God's Word says very clearly, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Who do you know who is absent from Holy Communion and worship right now? Understanding the tremendous benefits of gathering together here in God's house and the consequences of drifting away, Who can you reach out and invite and encourage to return to worship next weekend? Remember, speaking up and talking to someone is actually an act of love and concern for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Or consider what God's Word teaches about His gift of our sexuality. The Bible makes it clear that the only God-pleasing practice of sexual relationships is between a husband and wife in marriage. Hebrews 13.4 says... Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. God will judge the adulterer, and God will judge all the sexually immoral. Those words are so clear, I don't know how people talk themselves around them. So let's make sure to hold to these godly standards ourselves and expect our children to follow them as well. We don't care what everyone else is doing. We don't care what the media is promoting. We care about what's going to honor God as we live in humble obedience to his will. Sadly, the culture in which we live today is promoting sinful living as something to actually take pride in, as we were so foolishly encouraged to do last month, and cancels anyone who dares to still call sin a sin. That means you and I can expect to face tremendous peer pressure to keep silent, to compromise our beliefs, to join along in with the sinful crowd. But you have to remember, it is never loving to pat someone on the back who's caught up in sinful living. The loving thing to do is to humbly, gently share with them what God's word says about the matter. And then with great patience and careful instruction and love, urge them to turn from their sin and turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness, strength, and healing. And that leads us to our third key principle today. When you judge others, always follow God's word as the standard for determining right and wrong. Oh, it's becoming more and more obvious today that our society has little regard for biblical standards of morality. What the Bible says just doesn't hold a lot of weight for many people anymore today. In fact, much of what is being promoted today as good and wise is actually in direct 
opposition to the Bible. Now, we don't expect that the people of this world are going to pattern their lives after the teachings of the Bible. But we do expect our Christian brothers and sisters to do so. After all, every person who stood before God's altar to join our church by youth or adult confirmation made a solemn promise before God to stand firm in the confession of faith as they have learned it, to make faithful use of the Holy Scriptures and the Lord's Supper, and to lead a righteous, self-controlled, and godly life, remaining true to their triune God even to the end. Don't determine right and wrong based on public opinion polls, what the media is promoting, or what some public officials are saying these days. Rather, always follow God's word as a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. And because so many false teachers out there today are trying to twist and pervert God's word to make it agree with what their itching ears want to hear, it's also important that we diligently study God's word in context and join together with other Christians for group Bible study and mutual encouragement. Our Northwestern Publishing House is committed to putting out scripturally sound materials on just about any topic of Christian living. Time of Grace also offers excellent summaries of key Christian topics in these handy little booklets. Check out our church library or follow the links listed in your bulletin announcements today to help you understand what God's Word clearly teaches about these matters so you can hold on to the truth and reject all the errors. Yes, put on the full armor of God and you will be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. Is it ever okay to judge someone? Yes, of course it is. God's word often encourages us to do so. But when we judge others, we always need to remember these key biblical principles. When you judge someone, make sure you're always judging yourself first and humbly repenting of your own sinful behavior. Number two, when you judge, always speak the truth in love to benefit those who hear you. And finally, when you make judgments, always follow God's word as the standard for determining right from wrong. Then the judgments you offer will be pleasing to God and a blessing to those who hear you. May God grant us the wisdom and the courage to always make sound judgments. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're going to confess our faith today, singing a song of praise. You are God, we praise you. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O oh Father holy, all creation offers praise. The angels in heaven, with the cherubim and seraphim, with apostles and prophets, with the martyrs and your holy church. Oh, 
Christ, King of glory. We praise you, we praise you. You became a man to set us free. You have risen to free us. We praise you, we praise you. And with all your saints in glory, we sing Lord God, we praise you for your grace and kindness to us, expressed in the gift of your Son to be our substitute and Savior. Help us in our daily struggle against sin and temptation. Empower us to break free from sinful habits and overcome temptation. Help us to know the sacred truths of your word, defend them, and live by them. Bless our witness to those who are caught up in sinful living. Help us speak the truth in love for their benefit. Give us humility, wisdom, and courage to correct one another and build one another up in love. Bless our ministry here at Good Shepherd and the Lord's work elsewhere. Open hearts to hear and believe the good news about Jesus. We seek your protection this day for Thomas Gatsky, grandson of Lloyd and Joyce Gatsky, who has been deployed to Saudi Arabia. Direct his heart to your eternal son, Jesus Christ, and to his unchanging, faithful love. Lord, gratefully and confidently we come before your throne of grace on behalf of brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for Joanne Anderson, recovering following an injury, for Richard Schuster, the son of Edna Schuster, who's recovering following surgery, for Maureen Delege, friend of Kathleen Walther, dealing with health problems, and for Don Alexander, who is currently hospitalized. Cause your healing hand to rest on them. Strengthen them in body and soul, that they might rest in your love and honor you with their lives. Lord Jesus, you are the author and protector of marriage. We give you thanks for all the blessings of body and soul that you have given to and through Roger and Marlene Youngbeck over the 50 years of their married life. May your love for your bride, the church, continue to be their joy and strength. All this, Lord Jesus, we ask in your name. And in your name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. 
Let us praise the Lord. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Amen. 